So, uh, hello. hello. Um, we are going to talk about robot performance analysis, and my part will be about the automatically recorded data. That's the only reason why this is bold here. So, um, the overview of the first half is to give a motivation, then describe why MongoDB is a good generic robot database, and then uh, mention two applications where we have used that. So the long-term goal that Ingo and I both agree on, and that's why we're working together mostly, is we want to develop tools for generic performance analysis of the robot. So currently, the analysis is typically domain-specific, so there are no widely used generic tools, only you do it on a particular platform in a particular domain. Um, another thing is that data types do not have any semantics at the moment. It's just a type. And so it's a number, but not a distance value, and that's something that Ingo will talk about. And then the little thing, uh, the, the next thing is that there's little cross-platform comparison. So if you do your experiments on a peer two, it's very hard to compare them to experiments done on any other platform or for another task. So this is the goal to develop the concepts and tools for this framework-wide analysis. The first part is, so you have all seen similar pictures, so that's just a point cloud taken somewhere in a lab of ours, extract the, the table scene, and then get the objects on the table. That's something everybody's basically doing then. There's another uh, laser point cloud here that's a herb, and then you can also use that, for example, to find the little bottle on the, uh, on the table there. And then uh, there's another laser scan that you use for collision avoidance. But what all this data has in common that we acquired, we use it for some time to make decisions on the actual current behavior, but after what, we just scrap it and throw it away. And that's actually a waste of resources. What we argue is that it would be much better if we store most or some, at least some of this data to a database so that we can use it later on. So <laughs> we have come up with some criteria, and this is just an excerpt from, uh, from an IRIS paper. So what we want to do is to be able to store any and all data. And we want to do that in real time. Um, the reason is we do not want to run into the situation that afterwards you say, oh, I should have locked this particular piece of data, but now I cannot analyze what, what was going on. Um, another criterion is that we want to have powerful and expressive uh, retrieval features so that we can actually do something with the data afterwards, not just have it sitting on the hard drive. And we want to integrate with typical robot middleware. Here in particular, it's ROS, but we also have an integration with our own framework. Um, and we want to have minimal configuration that the student does not walk up to you and say, I know it was a pain in the ass, so I didn't run your logging, and you now we cannot analyze. So we determined that MongoDB is a suitable candidate for doing this. So it's a document-oriented schema-less database. And I will tell you what this means in a minute. And this was joint work with Sitzer Nivaza from uh, CMU. So document-oriented means that Unlike uh, SQL-based databases, we have group key value pairs in our database. So on the right side here, uh, you see an example document, and then you see in red the uh, keys, and then afterwards uh, the data that's stored in these keys. And all of this is embraced JSON-like in these uh, curly brackets. That means that this is one document. So it's schemaless, so there's no declaration or enforcement of a particular structure by the database. That sounds like chaos and havoc, but it's not. Actually, it's very useful, in particular when coming to robot applications that I will show in a second. But also the remedy, parts of this confusion is that we have collections. If you come from a, a relational database world, it's kind of a table, but not a real table. What it means is that typically in one collection you saw, store similarly structured documents. So, <coughs> um, in terms of ROS, to meet some of the criteria, um, with a topic-based peer-to-peer messaging and the ability to list all of the existing topics, we can easily exploit these middleware features to lock any and all data without configuration. So basically, we only uh, configure what we do not want to lock. For example, images in JPEG and RAW. We are usually only interested in one. So this is what we use to get the minimal, in particular, the minimal um, criterion up and running. So here's side by side. On the left-hand side, you see uh, the database document and the, uh, the output of ROS topic, echo, uh, of the transform topic. And on the right-hand side, you see the MongoDB document. And what you immediately see is that there's almost a one-to-one -one relation between the two. So that makes it particularly easy if we use that framework to uh, transform incoming data, any incoming uh, data, into MongoDB documents. And what it also means is that we sustain developer knowledge about the data structures that they used during the online system run and can now use it after the fact on the database. So uh, queries are built in MongoDB 
using a JavaScript-based query language. On the right-hand side, you see uh, two queries. Um, the upper one is there's a collection called behavior in which we store information about executed behavior. And this particular query um, gives us the document that describes the execution of grabbing a bottle the last time when it failed. So that easily allows us to get the time frame, for example, of the failed execution. And then later on, like in this one, we can use the start and end time that we have determined in the first query to get all the data that's related uh, to that time period where we were executing the behavior. Um, so you select based on document fields. You can query into sub-documents, as you see here. And it also supports nicely the MapReduce paradigm. Uh, there won't be an example in this one, but there's one in the paper, so if you're interested, it's there. So we have been doing some experiments on the PR2 uh, and HERP. Uh, the PR2 is well known. HERP is this guy on the right. It's the robot at CMU. Um, we also did synthetic recording benchmarks where we just took the transform topic because it's basically the one which transmits most of the messages and just send it at 100 hertz, which is already quite low. And we have two kinds of loggers. One is a C++-based logger and one is Python. Um, the Python logger is able to generically take any kind of message, parse it, and put it in a document. The backside is that the Python decoding of ROS messages is awfully slow. It's not about Python or about ROS, but it's about the crossing from the C and Python world in the uh, decoding process. So we have the same problem in ROS for example. So that's why we want to have C++-based loggers. But then comes another problem with ROS is that it does not support any kind of message reflection uh, in the C++ world. So we cannot build a generic logger in C++. So what we did is we uh, identified the most uh, transmitted messages in our system, either the ones which are uh, sent most frequent or the ones which are uh, largest in size and wrote specific C++ loggers which are a magnitude of uh, order of magnitude faster than the Python logger for these specific topic topics. So um, at the moment, and we discussed this before, so that is kind of a, an a bug in the in Rosback is that Rosback is even slower than the MongoDB logging. That's because uh, Rosback currently stores stores with each message it gets and needs to store into the file also the full message description into the file, and that's why uh, MongoDB logging, which doesn't do that, is more efficient and even faster at the moment. So the takeaway message from this is that storing robot runtime data to a database is efficient. And so it will, and it enables interesting new applications. I will show you a little bit about the applications in, uh, coming now. But MongoDB logging or logging in general to a database of the data that your robot is producing is not as, as expensive as most people are thinking, and you should really try it out. So there are two applications. The one, the first one, is joint work with Nicola Abdu, who is also sitting here somewhere, uh, Andreas Hertle, Borat Nebel, and um, Wolfram Bogart. Uh, from Freiburg University. So the task was to identify uh, cups on the table. So the classic tabletop scene is just a mock-up scenario to get the, the basic things going. So um, here you see the scenario as it's set up, and here you see the map, and the blue spots is our observation points that the robot will visit one after another. And during the full operation of the robot, it's recording all uh, point cloud data, image data, and transforms through the database. And <clears throat> the reason why we do this is that ultimately we want the robot to be able to figure out by itself where to go and from where to look. And why we do this is to fill the occlusions and shadows in our perception uh, from multiple perspectives, because otherwise uh, we can never analyze the full scene. So, and then afterwards, after we have gathered all the data in a database, we go back to the specific timestamps, extract the data from the database, realign the point clouds, and run the perception pipeline on the full merged point clouds. So, this is an example of uh, reconstruction and merging point clouds from a database online at runtime for perception. So that's the first thing, that's when you just get the point clouds from the uh, database, they look like junk, but once you did a f do a first initial alignment based on the AMCL localization that the robot had, you already get a, a somewhat good estimate. And then we do some uh, additional alignment steps. So first we uh, bias our perception and uh, filter out the data that we're not interested in and downsample it. 
then uh, do an ICP for the first alignment, which mostly aligns it by the table planes, then um, remove the table plane to bias it more by the objects that we're interested in, and then we get the full merged point cloud, and that's a top view of that. And here you can also see why we need to do this. So you see these shadows here. These you cannot fill unless you look from multiple perspectives on the data. So there's a little video, and I will quickly skim through this. After I do. Okay. So this is a robot. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the Arvis view. On the upper right-hand side, you see an objective observer, the camera on the outside. And then here, you see every now and then updated the image from the robot. So, and now it took the first point cloud, ran the perception, and what we already see is that it mislabeled some of the objects. So, we were looking at mid sized cups. So, the big cylindrical thing here should actually not be detected, and the boxes should also be rejected. So, let me quick forward a little bit through it. So, it will now go around. Um, oh, that doesn't work. Okay, it, it, it's going around the table, taking data from different perspectives. Merging them as it goes, that's just for visualization. And ultimately, in the end, it has acquired all the data it needs and it's able to correctly label all of the objects which are in the scene, which it wasn't able until before the last scan that it took. And it wouldn't be able if it would just take the last scan as well. So uh, there's, I think, a little more. Yeah, so here you can see that the objects have been correctly classified. So this was the first example for online usage. And here's another example where we applied the database for post-mortem for analysis on the recorded data. And that's an example of how we can use the data offline. That was uh, with a student of mine, Bastian Kling, and Professor Gerd Lackermeyer at our university. So what we want to do is uh, the robot is grasping the cup and it misses the cup by a few centimeters. And why is it doing that? And we want to analyze that. So again, we record all the data um, all the time, and on forward we interrupt the system, and now we go and look at the data. And what we do is we restore the data in the simulation environment, so that's gazebo now, and then uh, see the scene in the simulator from the perspective of the robot. So we get the actual perception data of the robot that it had at that time. So there's also a little video, it's a little shaky. So on the right-hand side, you see the, uh, the objective camera on the outside, little delayed, and on the left-hand side, you see the uh, reconstruction of this data uh, in the simulation. And you already see the table shaking. Sometimes it doesn't detect the table at all. Uh, there are only two objects at the moment. Now there are three. And eventually, what turned up here, we have some tool support to guide you through the search of all your data. And that led us to discover that one mount of a camera had shifted slightly, and then you couldn't detect it anymore properly. So it was just a static transform problem, not the first thing you would look into when you look for that error by yourself. You'll probably go and try to tune your perception first. Okay, I think that concludes my part of the talk. And now I hand over to Ingo. Okay. Thanks. So, okay. Um, so we'll take questions afterwards, I guess, seeing that Tim has already left. All right, so in a sense, that was the easy part. Um, and it's, it's a very nice, easy part. You can get lots of nice applications by logging data that, like that. But what I will be talking about now is the multi-source data acquisition part. And first of all, um, why do we, uh, would we need this? And what we're looking at here is what we want to enable you to do as uh, if you look at like things such as robot field trials, for example, I have this image here. Where this is a map, and there's multiple robots driving around on the map that communicate, and you want to analyze that data afterwards. Or you have human robot tests, uh, or you have continuous lab tests. In all of these situations, you don't need just the data that the robot has available internally, but you need um, also external environment data, maybe recording of the user, um, and maybe waypoint sensors uh, on, the on the terrain, so things such as that. And um, what we are particularly looking at at first, of course, with this sort of data, you could do lots of things, but we're looking at it first is some sort of a robot profiler. 
And I use this term profiling because it's like a performance profiler. It doesn't necessarily tell you why your code is, has a certain speed, but it tells you where to look more closely. And this is what we also want to do for uh, things such as these large data sets. Where are the problems situated? How severe are problems? And also, how does the internal view of the robot correspond to the external one, as we saw earlier? And so to give you a short sort of sneak preview of where we are headed with this, what kind of inspection we want you to be able to do is a look at this tool here. What you have here is you have multiple camera views. This is a camera view of the robot. There's another uh, camera on the robot. Here we have an outside camera looking down. And down below here we have various tiers. Uh, recording various data sources of the robot and their current values. We also have some uh, audio data here. And this sort of generic high-level view um, is hard to get with current tools, and I would like to explain a little bit more about how you can get it. Um, so for this sort of uh, view of your robot's performance, what you need is, first of all, you need to capture various data sources. And then you need to associate that data so that you know um, which, which of it belongs together. And that, the easiest method for that is temporal overlap. So if you have a camera view and you know it is a certain time and you have data from your robot and it's a certain time, then it matches. There are other more complicated methods for association, but that's not the focus. Then, particularly if you're looking at recording data for days or weeks, you need to verify completeness so that you're sure yet, to, yet you don't have any um, holes. And then the first step is usually visualization of your data. And that can already take some preparation and conversion. And you also, also usually need annotations to uh, provide ground truth, for example, of what actually happened as opposed to what the robot thought it ha happened. And then at the end, you would like maybe to compute some metrics using the database or so. And uh, what we are using for this purpose and what's quite an interesting tool is called Elan. Uh, it's usually developed by, the, uh, it's originally developed by linguists. And you might wonder, well, we have all these nice visualization tools in, in ROS already, so what's the point of having another one? This one is not for just display, it's for editing. So it's for annotation of the data. And it has very nice annotation and, and also time syncing tools are available on that. Uh, of course, you could use other tools. Most of what I will be talking about is applicable to other tools, but this is the one that we use. And one of the advantages is it has a very nice open data format that you can easily generate uh, into. Okay, and you might also ask yourselves, why don't we just use ROS back for recording? Well, apart from the fact that ROS back cannot record external data sources, it's really only intended for message data. So if you really want to uh, record audio video data, it's, it's not the most efficient storage format. And um, so, and, and usually also if you have something in a bag and you want to analyze it, you have to convert, take it out again and then convert it into some other analysis format. So why, don't, why not uh, record it directly to something that is easier to analyze? Uh, of course, what I'm building, so ROSBAG is still the tool to use for message logging. I'm just saying that there are also other tools. And so to support this sort of uh, logging, um, what we uh, wrote is called a meta logger, a robot meta logger RML. It's in, written in Python, it's a data capture framework, and it just calls lots of different capture tools. That's simple, but it makes your life easier. And uh, one other thing is it stores the data in the native format. So for a middleware capture from ROS, the native format might be ROS back, or it might be Tim's uh, MongoDB logging tool. Uh, for screen capture, uh, if you like, want to record teleoperation or something, you would record a video file. And uh, it has various camera supports actually in there. So for example, you can use network cameras. And one other thing it does for you is manage your sessions. So if you have an experiment, you usually, usually for example, have one test sub subject, that would be one session. You want to dis distinguish test subjects from each other. And within one test subject, you might have different runs. Maybe the first run didn't work. You try another one. You want to separate those out. 
And what we often saw before using a framework like this was that the, se the second run would overwrite data from the first run. So RML manages that for you. And then it also has conversion tools to various other things. Um, and one, one thing, if you use like a tool like RML or your other homegrown capture tool, I don't know, one of the things that's really important is setting up your sources. Um, if you want to associate your various sources afterwards, you need consistent timestamps if you want to do temporally based uh, association. But that's not usually a given. Um, you know, all like PCs, if you don't synchronize them, they all have their different clocks. And what we're really aiming for here is millisecond accuracy. It's not, uh, it's not a second is not enough. In a second, a lot of things happen in a second. So we really need more accuracy than that. And I just want to point out to some uh, tools you can use for that. For example, Network Time Protocol is probably known to many here. What is lesser known is that there's also a variant of that called a simple Network Time Protocol. And it's um, usable on embedded devices, for example, if they are network connected. And then you have things such as non-network connected cameras. Um, there we found a simple expedient of taking a picture of a sub-millisecond clock and then you have the offset that can associate it afterwards. If you have network cameras, network cameras usually use the real-time transport protocol, which also has NTP time timestamp embedded, but not all of the recording tools capture that timestamp, so you need to use one that does. And maybe one thing, if you have such a thing such as a waypoint sensor, um, Many of these do some internal logging, but don't include timestamps. So if you write software for that, include timestamps. So that's just preparation. And one other thing to note on timestamps is that it's not the time when it is in your application that counts. And I just put up here a little calculation for you. If you look at the camera, so something happens in the real world, and then the camera takes an image, and so the sending of the image can already take up to 10 milliseconds, depending on exposure time. Then there's usually some processing, and then the sense data is transmitted to the PC that already, for a 640 by 480 image in um, YUV 420, that takes 50 milliseconds. And then an application has some processing. So what, what you get when you have the image in your application, it's already between 20 and 40 milliseconds later than, uh, the, the, uh, than when it happened. And if you take larger image, it's like five megapixel images, then transport takes longer. Of course, if you have a different bus system, then the transport may be faster, but you know, the, the point to take away here is that um, you really need to get at the timestamp from the sensory source Many cameras support this. They can embed a timestamp of when the sensing actually happened, or you can try to compute this. This is just, you know, for association. And if, if you end up with data which is not temporarily synchronized, there's a few, few uh, heuristics that you can do, and they all boil down to finding a common event, an event that is observed uh, across sensors. And, for example, if in camera images, you usually use a clapper. Um, or you can also use a flash. Um, and if you have audio data, you can also audio correlation. If you have audio data for multiple cameras, you can correlate the audio streams. That's a very accurate method. And so what I wanted to point out here is try to record such data, which you might not actually need for your analysis, but which helps you to actually associate it later. So, and one, one thing I wanted to point out shortly here is that uh, for recording of audio video data, network cameras are quite useful. They output a compressed data stream, uh, which is not as good as a vision camera, but it's, uh, it's fairly CPU intensive to do compression. And so it's quite useful to have another one of these cameras, just, you know, observing the scene, outputting a readily compressed stream that you can record fully. And we, as a short plug, we found Basler Systems makes very high quality network cameras. So, this is all about, you know, getting data. What do we do with it when we have it? And um, 
if you look at the typical data, data analysis process, first you capture it, then you have to do some preparation, extract the data you want, and then run some metrics. So easy, right? Well, this preparation step can be a bitch. Um, so you need, first of all, you need to convert your data into common formats. You don't, wouldn't, wouldn't believe how many different timestamp formats are out there. And for many other data types, it's, it's similar. Then you need well-defined ranges. And um, this may be, your sensor may, may already provide this, but you need to know what it is. Maybe cleaning, remove, you know, have recorded a human robot experiment, and the cameras, you switch it on, and then 10 minutes later, the person comes, so you don't want to use these 10 minutes, so clean that out. And then, again, completeness checking. So if you do this in a multi-source environment, what we often see is that people run, you know, this for every source they have, they do this pipeline. That is very inefficient. And it usually results in not all of the sources that you would have available being used. So you do not want to do that. What we uh, suggest instead is that, you know, at least for the high level analysis, you do a model based approach of where you do your data capture in your various formats. And then you do some sort of structuring process which extracts just part of the data which is common across, across uh, many messages. And so for all of the messages and data types that support this model, you can then have one common pipeline afterwards, which is much easier to do. So to give you a few examples of what that could look like, one is the occurrence model. It's about the simplest model that you can use. It just includes, okay, I have what, what type is my message, what is its ID to distinguish different uh, messages of the same type, and when is the timestamp. And what this is useful for is completeness checking. For example, I displayed here in uh, Elon the histogram of message counts over all types. So it's not like Rx plot or Rx back, which you know just display one type. It's about all. And so you see here, you have this sort of heartbeat of message counts. And if you see a gap in this heartbeat, then you know, oh, message capture failed for that period of time. So it's a very quick and easy way to check that. Maybe a little bit more useful um, is a component activity model. So you want to know. Uh, which component was actually active during which time and what was the result. And for that, for example, you can um, use ROS Actions. Um, they provide this information out of the box. If, and if you convert this, for example, it looks like this. You have a, the act type of the action, then you have his, its ID, and then a start timestamp, and end timestamp, and then result. And you can do that for all actions in the system in a single way. And there's actually already an analysis script in RML which does this. And if you have this sort of extraction, what you get is a display like this one, where you have your various actions listed as tiers here in the display. And for each of them, you have the beginning and the end and the message ID. And for action lib, the message, the goal ID usually signifies who initiated the action. So if you look at this, this is all quite nice. So far, we already know what's going on, what failed, what succeeded. But we don't really know what the, what the action does. And for that, at the moment, you have to look at the video. That's why it's so important to have all the various data sources in one application. And, but theoretically, ideally, uh, what we would like is get more information out of the messages, again, in a generic way. And of course, what's also missing here is anything that does not use actions. So how do we get that sort of data? And what we did here is we uh, extended the ROS message definition format with type information. So this, this is just uh, an example. Uh, this is, of, of course, this is totally our own experiment. This is not standard. This might become standard if there's interest, but it's, it's just, you know, we needed this. And that's why I wanted to mention it here, and it might spark a discussion. And so, for example, we could do, say, something like this. The message field length is in meters. 
or x is a pixel, uh, pixel coordinate, or power is in watts, or maybe what is also interesting, there's this uh, string, it's called a label, and it has words in it, for example. So and if we have this additional information on your types, then what we can do is we do this generic analysis. We don't actually need to know what your type is about. We can extract anything that is a word, for example. And if we do that, again, this is a picture from the beginning. And I hope you can actually, yeah, you can read this, I hope. Um, so if you look here, for example, this is a re an object recognizer output. And here you see the word, it's unknown. It has an unknown picture. Or this is, for example, it's the robot, what is the robot speaking, and it's in German, okay. But here it's, it's, you see the output of the robot. Uh, what, what the robot is speaking, you see this directly. And so, of course, you could do this for your specific data type easily, right? But it would only work for your, for your type, so we don't have a generic tool. And if you use this sort of annotation, then we can do this for any message type that's out there in the system, even for message types we didn't know about at all before. So that would be our suggestion at this case. And with that, I'm already done here, so which is good, I think. We have some time for questions. But let me just shortly conclude, and uh, include, this is including uh, Tim's talk. So what I would like to, what we find is that this sort of system profiling needs a compact, high-level view. And it's important to uh, store data from multiple sources easily and uh, to give you additional insights. And the only point you have to look out for is the timestamp. And I also want to, I think that this model-based extraction uh, is very useful for generic inspection tasks. So this does not replace the, the types of feature and performance analysis that we have been doing before, but it gives you information where to apply it and which one to use. And finally, uh, referring back to Tim's talk, we found that uh, storing this runtime data that, uh, in a database is quite efficient and enables you to have interesting new applications because it's much easier to access it. And for example, we saw this online use for the multi-perspective perception, the offline use for postmortem scene reconstruction, and so on. And with that, we're done with the talking, and hope you have some questions. <laughs>